Hey, this is Jamie with Stonemeyer Games, and this week for today's Sunday sit down video, I'm going to talk about games with dry erase markers. Games that typically have a whiteboard element and dry erase markers that you can write on and then easily erase. I'm going to talk about, at the end of this video, I'll talk about my top 10 at the beginning, then at the end of the video, I'll talk about um, dry erase from kind of a production and design standpoint from my perspective. For the top 10, I do have one sheet on it because I could not actually think of a 10th game. So I only have nine games. The 10th is going to be Railroad Inc., which is a, a roll and write game that I have not played about building routes on a, uh, a kind of a secret whiteboard that you have. Um, so I don't know much about it. I'm not going to speak to that one, but some people have recommended it. I need to play it and then it can officially be on my top 10, hopefully, if I really enjoy it. Um, and I don't have photos of all these. I do have some of these games here on the table that I will show you when I get to them on this list. My number nine is Ex Libris. Ex Libris? Libris, I think that's how you say it. This is a game about, um, about acquiring books in a certain order. Books are on these cards that you get. Uh, it's a really interesting game. A lot of uh, variation in the worker placement tiles that are available each game. And the names of the books are really, really clever. I think the designer did a really good job uh, determining the names of the books. I think it was partially determined by algorithm, partially uh, by designer influence. And the whiteboard, as I recall, it's been a while since I played this game, but the whiteboard in Ex Libris is the scoreboard at the end of the game. And I feel like each player has one, but I don't know if that can actually be correct the way I look back at it. But, but it might be right. Each player might have their own scoreboard at the end of the game. That might be wrong. But uh, Ex Libris does have a whiteboard and a dry erase element in the, the scoreboard element. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later when I get to the, uh, the design part of the discussion, whether or not uh, a score pad versus a scoreboard is better. Um, let's see. Number eight is Quix. This is another one that I have not played in a while. This is another uh, roll and write game. It feels a little bit like the precursor, precursor to uh, Ganshan Clever, but uh, Quix is very easy to play, very easy to teach in terms of rolling the dice and how you're deciding which dice to, uh, to actually write down on your tableau. And, uh, I think the version of Quix I played may have been uh, a pencil and paper, but I've heard that the latest version does have dry erase and whiteboard elements to it uh, so that you can just check off the boxes, show the, which dice that you've rolled, write down the numbers, and then erase it at the end of the game. I know this list isn't very interesting yet because I'm just talking about like rolling and writing things down, but I, I promise there are some interesting elements coming up. My number seven is Wits and Wagers. Um, Wits and Wagers, I, I typically do not enjoy trivia games because I'm really bad at trivia, but Wits and Wagers gets around that um, by asking questions that not many people, I think, know, even if you are, are a, a trivia savant. Um, and it asks questions about numbers. So it might say, like, how many blue whales are there in the world? And uh, everybody writes down on their, on their little whiteboard pad, everyone writes down the number that they think is right. And then... Uh, everyone shows those numbers and you put them in a row on the table from, from least to greatest. And then you get to place bets based on which number you think is actually correct. So it's this beautiful element, in a, especially in a trivia game, of seeing what the group think is. So you might have written down like a million blue whales and everyone else might have written down like between 500 to 1,000. And you must realize, okay, I know nothing about blue whales, but these people might actually know something about it. And so you can kind of bet closer to their bids rather than your bid. And then you take your whiteboard pad back or whiteboard little 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 board, and then you you uh, erase it. So I think uh, this is a good example in a whiteboard game of um, repeated writing and erasing where it just wouldn't be as effective if uh, if either A, you were writing down using pencil and paper and constantly having to like cross it out or erase it or, you know, it would be confusing which number you're actually writing down. Um, or using some other system of indicating the number would probably require a much more co complex series of components. Like if you had to use dice to ten, uh, uh, ten, ten sided dice to determine like what the number is and just put that on the table, the dice are going to get jostled and moved around. The whiteboard and dry erase markers work perfectly here. So that is, uh, that was Wits and Wagers, my number seven. My number six is Captain Sonar. This is where things start to get pretty interesting. Captain Sonar is a game, it's a team-based game, where uh, there's a giant shield in the middle of the table. One of my favorite components in any game. I love this giant shield because it really immerses you in your team versus the other team. That's irrelevant to the dry erase element, though. And every player, it's usually four versus four is, I think, the ideal way to play Captain Sonar. Um, each player has their own specific role 
in the game, and all the roles involve dry erase. So there's the the engineer who's trying to to connect different things on his on his board and or not trying to connect, trying almost not to connect certain things so that the, all elements of the uh, the submarine stay live. Um, the the captain is charting the course and drawing down drawing out where exactly they are on the board and which areas on the on the board they are um, they are targeting at different times. Um, there's and then there's a there's one of the other roles. I, mean, I won't go into all of them, but there's another role of a player who is uh, trying to determine where the opposing submarine is. So they have this map with all these islands, and the other team is saying that they are going, that they're doing a certain thing, and they're they're using the limited information they have to try to figure out where the opponent submarine is. Uh, the dry race works really well here. Uh, because you often make mistakes in this game. You might you might need to... There are certain times where you... I think when you maybe surface that you get to erase some of the lines. Or especially for the player who's trying to track the other submarine. It's nice to see the lines that you've drawn. But at times you might realize, okay, that, that I really messed up here. This isn't correct. I also like in, in Captain Sonar, for a few of the rules, they use uh, overlays. And so you have like a, a, a map that's in front of you, but then you have a, pla a clear plastic overlay that you're writing on on top of it. And you're moving that overlay around to see what makes sense, particularly if you're trying to figure out the location of the other player's submarine. Um, so this, uh, this is a, a really great use, I think, of whiteboard in that uh, you're actively writing quite a bit during the game, but you're also erasing during the game. The engineer erases a ton of the time. The engineer is hoping to erase things at, at different times. Um, and so I think that combination of writing and, er and erasing works really well for, for dry erase games. Or that's a reason to in include dry erase in a game. That's my number six, Captain Sonar. My number five is Treasure Island. Uh, this is one that I played a couple times over the last few months. Uh, in Treasure Island, you uh, most players are uh, trying to determine where... Who's the bad guy in it? Uh, it's a famous pirate. I will say it's Blackbeard. I don't know if it's actually Blackbeard. Where, where Blackbeard hid his treasure. And Blackbeard is one of the players, and all the other players are competitive treasure hunters trying to find out where uh, Blackbeard's treasure is. And over the course of the game, Blackbeard is giving the players hints. Some of the hints are uh, general, like, like standard type hints that I might I, I might move my character on the board to a certain place and say, okay, am I w within range of, of the treasure here? Um, and you, you have these little um, plastic pieces that you'll put on the board and you'll trace around them to show exactly the area that you are currently looking at for like a small search or a big search. And each player also has some special asymmetric rules, and some uh, the Blackbeard also has some some clues that he must give to players to indicate like um, entire quadrants of the board where the treasure is or isn't. And the the really cool thing here, I think, um, is that the game could have asked players to remember all this stuff or just to write it down on their own personal maps. Instead. Not only is your personal private player mat a, uh, a whiteboard style, uh, style material, but the entire game board is too. And so at the end of the game, or throughout the game, you were actively writing down in dry erase on the board itself uh, to, to show what, what's out there, to, to show what you've looked at, what you haven't looked at. Um, and it becomes kind of a mess. It, it, it doesn't really look pretty by the end of the game, but it's a great way of communicating clearly, clearly to players areas of the board that... Uh, that the treasure is not in and areas of the board where the treasure is in. And that's really important in this game because the treasure is just a little speck on this giant island that you were trying to find. Um, so it, it's rather difficult to find the treasure. And at times, Blackbeard can even lie to you. So you might, you kind of have to be careful there as to which parts of the board that you truly cross off because you may have crossed off the wrong area. Um, I will get, I will come back to this later in the production discussion because there's one thing that I think they may, maybe messed up a little bit, especially with the edition I played. They may have fixed it in previous in, in subsequent editions. But uh, overall, I love that element in uh, Treasure Island of seeing what you and other players, what information you and the other players, uh, the public information, have gathered over the course of the game so you don't have to just remember it or write it down on your own little pri private map. That is uh, number five, Treasure Island. My number four, we finally, yeah, we're finally getting to a game that I have. A fake artist goes to New York. Uh, in this game, there is one player who is the uh, the clue giver. The I think yeah, I think they're the clue giver, and they take these different little whiteboard pads, 
they take them off to the side. So say we're playing in a uh, five-player game. I'll take four, four of these pads off to the side. I will write down a word, the exact same word, on three of them, and then I'll write down an X on the fourth. Um, and then I'll return them and kind of shuffle them up. And when I, when I play this game, I don't even try to look at like which of these tiles I wrote down the X on because I want it to be a surprise for me too if I'm the question giver uh, or the clue giver. And then all players take turns drawing on this little pad of paper uh, without lifting their pencil off the pad, which is a rule that we messed up for a while. But you have to, you put your own little color pen, every player has their own little color pen, which is not a whiteboard. You're putting it on this pad and drawing something, and then the next player draws something else. And you're trying to communicate to the other players that you know what the clue is. And eventually you're gonna get around to the fake artist, the player who has the X on their whiteboard, and they are going to try to just follow along and, pr and make other players believe that they know the actual clue um, by what they draw on this pad, but they don't actually know. So it's a, it's a really interesting game. It's kind of like Spyfall, if you played Spyfall. It's, it's really, for a while, it's been one of my favorite games. I haven't played it in, in a little bit, but it, it's one of my favorite games because of the, the moments, the, the weird drawings that come up, the, the crazy things that the fake artist does to try to deceive the other players. And I really like the whiteboard element here. The game could have used cards. It could have come up with a bunch of cards and said, okay, these are the words that you have to use. But there's complete freedom here. There's no suggestions in the game. So the, the question giver goes off to the side and they write down anything they want on these tiles um, and then give them to the other players. So I really like the use of whiteboard in this game. And this is one of the few games that actually uses whiteboard and a pad of paper uh, with, with different colored pens. They use both of those components, two of these different things that are usually in, in conflict with one another, they usually choose one or the other. The game's game has both of them. Again, this game does have one little thing that I'll talk about in the production decision um, discussion that, uh, that I might do differently now that I know about a different game that does this in a different way. I'll get to that in a second. That was uh, Fake Artist Goes to New York, little oink game, uh, mine number four. My number three, oh, I do have this game. Excuse me, let me let me grab this one. I totally forgot that I had this one. <laughs> I don't think I've ever left camera on one of these videos before, but Telestrations is my number three. And now that we're at the top three, it was really hard to choose between these top three. This may change at any time. Telestrations is a game where uh, you have a little whiteboard pad. It looks like this. And you write your name down here and you write down a secret word of your own choosing. There's a whole book of cards that you can choose to get that secret word. In my group, when we play, we just write down whatever we want. Um, write down your secret word, and then depending on I get my ideal way to play, there, there's like instructions as to uh, whether or not you have an even or odd number of players. My ideal way to play is that you write down the word, and then you uh, flip the book, and then you pass it to the next player. And then that player has to, as it says here, sketch it. They have to draw um, what that word is, and they have one minute to do so. So they get to look at the word. And then they flip the page, and they pass it to the next player. And that player looks at the drawing, only the drawing, not the actual word, and then they guess what they think it is. They write down the word or words to determine what it is. And then this goes around the table. Where they pass it to the next player, that, that player has to draw it. And it goes around the table. It's a party game, but I think it's a party game for, for introverts like me. Uh, because you are very rarely the center of attention. You're all kind of, you, you each have this series of private jokes that you're experiencing with each other. And, uh, and you're each kind of challenged on an ongoing basis to make sense of whatever, ha whatever you're looking at, whether it's a word or a drawing. But I really like the use of whiteboard here. You could, in fact, I think this game originated with uh, pencil and paper, but uh, I think it works so much better with this whiteboard just because you can flip it, you can hide the information at the right times, you, can, you know exactly what information you need to look at at any given time because you're just flipping back one page. Um, and you can just you can reuse it time and time again. We've played many many games on here. Uh, the the one catch with this game that I will mention now, rather than in the design discussion, is if you play with certain if you play with adults, eventually you're going to have some crude drawings on these pads. And every now and then, someone's going to forget to erase their drawing, and hopefully that doesn't show up in the wrong moment with the wrong group. So that's one kind of catch with whiteboard games. If you they because of the playfulness they often uh, encourage. Uh, if you forget to erase it, it can become difficult to erase and it can show up the next time you play and 
the people you play with that time might be very different people than the people that you played with when you draw when you drew the crew drawings in the previous game. So that's something to I don't know, not necessarily to think in, uh, to keep in mind when you design, but uh, it's it's a slight downside I think with with this style of game. So that is Telestrations, my number three. My number two, again, this is very difficult. This is a, a new favorite of mine and not one. Oh, you know, I do have 10 games. I totally forgot about one. Okay, awesome. All right, we're kicking, we're kicking Railroad Inc. off the list. Uh, shifting the numbers, doing a live change here. Uh, what we're saying now I'm, I'm in my top three. Telestrations is my number four. Oh, man, this just got tough. I'm going to say, I'm going to say that On Tour is my number three, which is very difficult because I love On Tour. On Tour is a game that could have easily been a game where you are uh, uh, writing down on, on pencil and paper. It's a roll and write game. One player rolls these giant dice. You are writing down two numbers on what could have been a pad of paper, but instead is this beautiful folding board here. You're, you're writing numbers on this map to determine um, your, your band's tour throughout the game. I don't know how I left this off my list. This is one of my favorite games. Uh, but so you're, you're, you're writing down a number on this map and trying to connect the, the, the different cities, the different states here um, in, in uh, ascending order at the end of the game. You don't have to connect them during the game. But I think the, the whiteboard... Even though it could have been pencil and paper, I think the whiteboard just works really, really well here for a few different reasons. One is um, this game scales infinitely. You can scale any number of players. So if you have enough of these pads, uh, or even if you print off some some pieces of paper, uh, you can you can really play any number of players. And so the 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 thick element of these pads works really well because. You might not even have enough seats to accommodate all the players who are playing this game with you. So, like sometimes when I play on tour, I'll just lean back and kind of kind of write on my pad. Maybe there's no table space for me to do so. It also hides information really well. So if I want to kind of keep a little bit of information from other players, it's not really that type of game where you're hiding it. But it allows you that ability to do so because of the type of board they used for it. Um, and I just think it, it ends up being a, a really high quality component instead of a, a, a throwaway component. There is a downside to this, I'll talk about it in the production discussion, but I think they did this really, really well. That is on tour, my impromptu edition of no, as number, number three. My number two is QE. QE is a game that I've talked about recently in a few different videos because I've really, really enjoyed it. It's a game where you are um, bidding for, you're, doing, you're placing a blind bid for uh, a tile that you were hoping to win. And uh, you can write down literally any number. And coincidentally, it's, it's made by the same company as On Tour, uh, the boardgametables.com. Um, you can write down any number in the world. You can see my recent videos about the impact that has. But the key is that because you have complete flexibility, you, uh, you're, you're not bidding like a set amount of cash that you have in your hand or coins that you have in your hand. You are writing down any number on a little whiteboard. And then you're, you're passing that whiteboard to another player. And they also end up writing down the winning bid on the back of the tile that you won. That information becomes important at the end of the game because the player who spent the most during the game cannot win. So they need to look, all players need to look at their winning tiles at the end of the game to see what their bids were, to add them up and see uh, if they are even eligible to be a part of the final scoring. Um, so I really like I, the, the whiteboard element, the dry erase element just works really well and that you're passing tiles across the table. You're, you're writing on a tile that you're retaining until the end of the game. Uh, I, I think it's almost necessary for this game to use whiteboard and it does so really well. That's QE, um, which I believe stands for, uh, qualitative easing, quantitative easing. One of those two as my number two. My number one, which I, I played last night, I love this game so much. It's up for one of the big German awards this year, is Just One. Um, Just One is a fully cooperative party game where you are uh, you take turns uh, having a card in front of you that you can't see that has a couple different words on it. You randomly say, okay, word number three. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, and so here's an example here. So say I say number three, shelf. Um, I don't know what that word is. All other players know what it is, and they, on their little whiteboard pads, or whiteboard standees, write down the word itself, 
or not that, right, they don't write down the word. They write down a one word clue to help me guess what shelf is um, so that I can guess that, that word. And uh, the really brilliant hook here in this game is that after all players have written down their guess, I close my eyes and they all reveal to each other. And if any of the clues are identical, uh, they uh, have to put those face down on the table. They lose the ability to show me those clues. So I have limited information then. So you're trying to write down words that tell me what shelf is, but aren't the most obvious clue for shelf. This component is absolutely brilliant um, for a number of reasons. And I'm going to merge this into the, the production dis discussion for a second here because a um, few different reasons. One, uh, this little shelf here, holds uh, the card when it's facing away from me. So whenever any player has a card, they, they can put it up on the stand and it just, just sits there. Brilliant. The stand does something else too though, because when you write on here, uh, and this is hard plastic, it's very hard plastic. When you write on your dry erase marker here um, and you put it down on the table, the shelf prevents, I don't know if you can see it there, the shelf prevents this flat part from rubbing against the table. And so it doesn't get ink on the table and it doesn't smear the, the word that you wrote down on this tile. That's brilliant, especially for a whiteboard game. And the last part is just a nice little touch that uh, to, to signal to other players that you are ready, that you've written your clue, it's a nice little signal. You don't have to put thumbs up on the table or anything. You just write down your clue, you put it face down on the table, and then when you see that everyone has done that, that's when you know you can tell the person to close their eyes and reveal the, the other players. So this is, this is like the component of the year. This small little plastic device is just so brilliantly designed. It's fantastic. Um, so yeah, let's talk about a few other design elements. So from production standpoint, and this is what I was referring to with fake artists. With fake artists, something that can happen as you like shuffle up these tiles or as you pass them out to other players is that the ink can get smeared. And so I think this is just strictly a better version of this component. This is cheaper, but I think this is better. And so you might want to think about that if you're, put, if you're putting together a dry erase game, the element of, of, um, of smearing I think should be a factor in, in your production decisions. Um, it's not always a factor because obviously some of these games have hidden information. Some of them like on tour do not. Uh, another factor is uh, the, 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 uh, the markers themselves. So a lot of these games use different colored markers, uh, which, is, which is great if you're trying to communicate, if you need to communicate different colors to, to, uh, to, the, to certain players, which is... I would say in just one is not incredibly important um, because typically you have your little standy right in front of you. You don't you don't mix them up with other players, um, and so the, there are two considerations with these markers. One is with the colors that you choose. If you do, do choose different colors, first I guess determine do I really need different colors? Because if you don't, then you can just go with dark colors like black, blue, or purple, or just all black, um, which is generally going to be the most visible color. Uh, because some of these end up being fairly hard to see uh, in, in low lighting in particular. Like you'll notice that in just one, they didn't use yellow because yellow would be really hard to see from across the table. In the game Treasure Island, I mentioned that there was a slight issue with it. And the slight issue is that it does have some colors like orange here. I think it might have a pink, um, but it has a lighter, a few lighter colors that just don't show up well on the map, whereas the dark colors show up really well. And in Treasure Island, that's kind of tough because it, it is fairly important to see who drew what on the board. So you can remember, okay, I drew here, you drew, you drew there. Um, that's information that you have that you shared that I didn't. Um, so I think it's really important to consider the darkness of the markers and how they actually show up when you're writing on whatever surface you end up writing on. It's fairly easy if you're writing on a white surface, if you're writing on a colorful surface like Treasure Island or even on tour, you need to consider the darkness of those colors. Um, the last factor with these markers to consider is the quality of the marker itself. Uh, typically the points of the markers aren't all that fine. Uh, they're fairly fine, but they're just not as fine as like a pencil. And uh, I found with some of these games, like these have built-in erasers, which is great. But some of these pens, uh, they don't stay on. So you have it in your hand like this, and it'll, like, it'll pop, off, pop off as you're writing with it. This goes across the table. You might get ink on your hands. So I think uh, considering like the length of the pen and how well the top stays on the back of it are all little things that will end up being annoying to players. Like, it won't ruin the game. It's not going to hurt your game's rating or anything. But 
but I think it does uh, help if you really think about, if you don't just go with like the cheapest pen. Um, I'm not saying this is at all, but uh, consider these things and consider that uh, if you're making a lot of copies of the game, you might be able to just make your own pen. You might be able to make a mold for it or find a manufacturer that has a, the type of top that really stays on there. Th this just comes off too easily. Uh, the other side of the discussion I wanted to mention is uh, the debate, I guess, between using whiteboard and dry erase versus using pencil and paper and uh, a pad of paper. So there are a couple different elements here. One is uh, score, score pads. So are score pads better if you have a score pad to write on um, versus a score pad uh, that is, that is oh, I guess they're, you're writing on both of them, but a, a score pad that you're, you're writing in pencil versus a, a dry erase score pad. I think they both have their merits, but I personally lean towards the, uh, the score pad that, that uses pencil and paper. And the reason for that is that you get to keep an artifact of the game. You get to keep that piece of paper, if you want to, in the box, and in, in, in the future you can look back and say, oh, remember that time that I scored 150 points or, or remember that time I did this or, or this, that I tried this strategy. And this really carries over to um, games like, like Welcome to Roll and Write Games too, where you have your own private sheet of paper, not just a score pad. That, that artifact that you get to keep uh, forever, I think is pretty cool. Not everyone cares about that, but, um, but I, I, I just don't know if dry erase elevates a game uh, especially with score pads. I, I don't necessarily think they elevate a game there when you could just be uh, keeping that or creating and keeping that artifact. For your own personal thing, like an on tour where you have you have a, a map, um, I, I, I tend to lean towards whiteboard there in most cases and dry erase because of replayability. Like in Welcome To, I've gone through my book. I've, I've exhausted all 100 pages of that book because I love the game and I played it so much. And there are other ways for me to get refills now, but uh, but that that it's a, it's a little inconvenient to do that. So if you have a game where the player count is fairly high, where you think you might go through that book quite a bit, um, I think whiteboard is a good consideration. The only downside with whiteboard there, though, is as I mentioned, the the tips just aren't ever going to be as fine as a pencil or pen, and so. If you, if you need really fine details on the game itself or on whatever you're writing on, then um, I think a pen or, or pencil and paper can be more effective than a, a, a big, thick dry erase marker or even a, a thin dry erase marker. Uh, the, other, the other factor here is cost. Um, I actually don't think I've ever priced out dry erase, but I cannot imagine that dry erase marker, including all these markers, and these nice boards or whatever you like or like in the on tour the on tour boards especially that's that's definitely more expensive than a than a score pad a score pad is really or, or a pad of paper is not expensive to make at all and most games that use that score pad don't include the utensil they expect you to bring your own pencil and paper which i think is perfectly or pencil or pen i think that's perfectly reasonable for a game to ask you to bring that so Cost can be a factor in these games. I don't think it should be the sole factor, especially if there's a game like Just One where it just makes the game so much better to have these components than if they were pencil and paper. But, uh, but for like a, a score pad decision where it's really gonna have a very minimal impact on the game, uh, it might even be better if you have that, that artifact, that pencil and paper artifact. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's something to consider, the, the cost, the production cost of having all the dry erase materials versus just Literally, like we're talking like a 15 cent pad of paper, especially if, it's, if there's no color. Um, it's very, very inexpensive to, to print that pad of paper. Uh, yeah, so those are, those are the two, I think, production things to consider, like the, the quality of the materials and whether or not you sh uh, it's better for your game to have dry erase versus uh, pencil and paper. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, though. I think those are, that's just my opinion. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on games where you, where you prefer to see the dry erase, games where you prefer to see the pencil and paper, or maybe it's more black and white for you. Maybe you always want one or the other. Um, and other considerations that I mentioned. Maybe so there are some things, component considerations that I did not think of. And especially if you can think of other games that use this component and this mechanism um, or these mechanisms, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments as well. Obviously, my list was and only ended up being 11 games along. So I'm sure there are others out there that I'm not thinking of, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on them in the comments. All right, this video ended up actually being quite long. I thought this might be a quickie, but uh, yeah. 
30 minutes about dry erase games. Pretty cool. Thank you for joining me, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comments. Take care.